back and we are back in my apartment back in my space um not quite back to a normal state of mind but we are back physically i'm making some tea so hopefully we'll get back to our normal voice um back to not having a terrible cough um i went to fox in the snow this morning which is a really cute little coffee shop. I'm sorry for some of the background noise. Um, my dishwashers, my washing machine's running. The tea kettle is boiling now. Um, so I went over to that little coffee shop and I had like a really nice chill like Bible time by myself, dwelling in some stuff, thinking through things, processing things. <sighs> it's good to be alone. Like that was some good alone time. I mean, I drove by myself for eight and a half hours, but that's not really peaceful. <laughs> Like, at least for me, that was not peaceful. Um, it's normally better if the weather's good. Like, driving today was a breeze. It was no problem at all. Because the weather's really nice, and I'm back to my normal places where I live and things that I normally do. Um, guys, I feel already so much better. Um, spending an entire day over at my friend Kayla's house was such a big blessing. Um, I'm so thankful for them to let me stay there a couple nights. Um, but that's why yesterday's vlog was like a minute long. I'm not even sure if I'm gonna upload it. Now that I'm saying that, I probably will, but it's gonna be <laughs> the shortest one ever. Um, just one little minute of me talking to my camera before someone came in, <laughs> like we talked for a bit. Um, but I don't know, I'm probably gonna do a more in-depth like summary of how this weekend went and maybe talk about New Year's goals. I don't really believe in setting ridiculous goals for New Year's. It's a nice time to um, take advantage of that um, new start logical fallacy where we can just kind of be like, all right, we're going to just start off new and completely be different. And then, of course, when we do mess up like we always do, it becomes very difficult not to be so judgmental. I mean, even like when I started these vlogs, I was like, I'm going to do it perfectly. Like it was a new start kind of thing with that as well. But that can be really difficult to balance with um, mistakes that are made, like life that happens and um, things that happen, like, I've already made a few mistakes this new year, like, nothing huge, but, like, you know, I'm letting myself down a little bit, so it's, like, all right, we have to figure that out, and have to figure out how to focus on better, not perfect, focus on improvement, not perfection, oh, shoot, I almost just got exposed by, um, oh, I feel very exposed right now, um, that was a mistake, guys, pest control guys just walked by something, and I'm not worried. I'm just chilling here in my dining room, minding my own business, and they come walking by with their boxes. I don't know what's happening. Um, but anyway, here we are hiding in the kitchen, and they walk by, so I might close the blinds. I'm so funny. Okay, well, that was incredibly awkward, and I'm still vlogging, so <laughs> you know how I feel about that. Um, wow, that was <laughs> awkward. Um, but yeah, this is... <laughs> great start to this vlog series again um picking this back up as soon as possible getting back into my normal swing of things um but yeah <laughs> today is gonna be mostly just unpacking and getting all my laundry caught up and making myself tea getting over being sick and um de-stressing decompressing and processing in my own space at my own time and editing some of these vlogs too which is gonna be fun um i was originally like I have a few scheduled out for the next few days, but the logos and the like thumbnails were terrible because I was making them from my laptop. So I'm gonna fix those because I got here in time to do that. Um, that is, <laughs> I can't get over that. That's really funny. They looked so confused um, and I'm dying of embarrassment. But you know, it's, I just have legs. Like it could be worse. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. Could be a lot of a lot more of me rambling to the camera about things, but I needed yesterday to be like camera free time. But I also am gonna need a lot of time today to just chill and not be sick. And again, talking a lot is probably not the smartest idea, um, with my voice being how it is right now. Um, yeah, this has been an adventure, and I can get more into why I left early, but there's not a whole lot to it. It just felt like time, and like you know. Removing yourself from a situation that feels on the brink of being very unhealthy so that you don't intervene in a way that's unhealthy is healthy. So just random life advice, like, you know, if you know your tendency is to try to fix things 
and things start going off trail and it's not your place to fix them, maybe the smart thing to do is get yourself out of it. Even if it's awkward and you aren't able to explain why you left to everybody, um, yeah, be wise and being wise sometimes mean means making other people unhappy. <laughs> like, it's gonna be a give and take um, with that. I don't know, man, it's been a lot to process lately. Um, but now that I'm here, I'm gonna be working through it. I'm gonna be reading some interesting books, reading some more challenging ones, um, thinking through capstones, getting my life together with portfolio stuff. <sighs> I just have to do it, honestly. And I've talked about this before, but I just have to sit down and do the work. I've done the hard part. Like, I know myself pretty well at this point. Um, and doing these vlogs has been really, really helpful for that. Um, sorry my hair is like a horrible mess too because I just started videotaping this like for, you know, because I felt like I should. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to start working on some of that, but first is just getting um, unpacked. Um, I don't want to just dive into a project because I don't feel comfortable being still, you know? I want to be comfortable being still, being still with myself, being honest with myself, and then being like, alright, now that I know this about myself, how do we move forward? So, the first step, getting some tea. Second step, finishing up my laundry. Third step, getting my room in order. I have some ideas for another project with my under the bed space. I have to go buy some uh, some uh, goods to make that an actual reality. Or scrounge together some stuff from my garage, depending. We'll see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fiddle around, see what I can do, but I don't know, might as well make fun, something fun. I don't know. I don't even know if I'll have time for it, honestly, but it'd be something to do, so. So, um, I haven't really unpacked a whole lot, and I haven't had, like, the most insane productive day. Um, I do have really frizzy hair, though, so that's a plus. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm in a weird mood. I don't know what to say about it. Um, I've watched several more breakdowns of, um, Parasite, because, you know, I'm thinking about it. But I had another thought um, while I was on my long, long drive here, and I was thinking about how, and this is kind of a longer conversation, but my capstone project that I want to do in the industry I'm thinking of getting into, that whole industry of like alternative manufacturing using like nature as the primary source of inspiration and the primary client, I'm... I'm struggling with this idea that it, it is, I'm not sure how to word this, that it's almost just like a support beam for the amount of overconsumption. Like, I, I feel like it's only a countermeasure to the horrible things that have been happening with climate, rather than as like much of a change as I want it to be. Like, I really want it to be this huge, huge powerful thing that I can make a huge impact in and I know it would be but if we're not dismantling the system that's producing overconsumption and if we're not dismantling the ideas of completely just destroying the environment like one person me jumping into the field of material ecology or alternative fuel sources or alternative all that stuff isn't really going to make that big of a difference and I'm struggling with that, like, it's gonna be, it's, it's hard, like, I can't, the, the main takeaway that I've been thinking about is that I, I will be pursuing these things still, but I can't just pursue them blindly, right, I have to be educated and having conversations about preventing these things from happening to begin with, so that we don't have to make these, like, you know, slapping band-aids on kind of measures, and it is, I think that researching these things and building them up will help to prepare for an overall like shifting in how we manufacture and how we produce and what kind of things we care about but there has to be a cultural shift too like there has to be a mental shift of okay we've tried overconsumption we've tried overly manufacturing we've tried making as much money as possible we've tried that um what do we do now like there has to be a next step there has to be, and, and I do think that alternative manufacturing processes can be part of that shift, but I'm, I've been thinking more and more lately that, like, there has to still be a dismay, like, there still has to be a change. Like, I can't 
in good conscience just dive in and ignore the entire like cascading burning heap behind this like really nice looking project of like all right alternative manufacturing but if I'm still using those same systems and same processes to create this new one like what's going on we have to change this whole process and how we do that I don't know I've also been thinking lately how jank how weird it is that Amazon is owned by like one person like it's kind of weird that it's such a like it it would be like the equivalent of like and this is not a good example. This is not a quite, I don't really know 100% what I'm talking about. I'm not, you know, political science or like all this stuff major. This is just what's been floating around in my head. Like when America was first founded, they had this, what they would call like a, what's the word? It's kind of like a, it's on the tip of my tongue. I took a literature class, a literature class a few years ago that talked about it. But we had this re republic of letters, I think, I think so. But basically everybody could be anonymous and just send out letters and then everybody would see them and be like, oh, this is a really interesting dialogue on this topic. Basically, olden days Reddit. Um, <laughs> olden days Reddit were like three people were talking instead of a billion. Um, <laughs> but the nice thing about that is that it was owned, like nobody owned any of that. Like it was all anonymous, but then it was also like, that's not a good example because it doesn't really represent the free market. But you know what I mean? Like Amazon is like its online version of a free market and if it was like the Republic of Letters, there would be no person, no single person responsible for making this environment possible. Like this environment where people can buy things online and all that stuff is possible because of Amazon, the company creating this website that is, has to be kind of owned by something bigger to make it sustainable as far as like the amount of people that are on the website, the amount of things that are happening. We all know if the government owned it, it would be a nightmare. Like, it would not work well. No one would use it. They'd find another Amazon and use that instead. But, like, can we get, like, a independently owned version? Like, where workers own the whole company of Amazon? Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like that's... I don't know. I just feel weird about, like, the way that it's just funneling to one person's pocket. It's just, like, unnecessary cultural commentary. But, you know, this is just what I've been thinking about lately. It's, it's really weird that it's owned by one person. It's really, really weird. Um, and it's weird that it's marketed as, like, better than buying it from your local store or other things. Like, it's really weird that it's just, like, taken that place. And this ties back to what um, one of the videos I watched, like, last, I think, a couple weeks ago, talked about with, like, techno-feudalism being the kind of status we live in now. It's not even, like, normal capitalism in anymore. It's, like, techno feudalism where really it's run by you know a larger company this is like weird consp almost conspiracy theory stuff i'm talking about but like you know if you think about it like facebook and instagram like okay if they're both owned by meta but like youtube and other things those have so much power now that and microsoft and other companies that like just didn't exist before and if this was like medieval europe those would be the kings and we would be the servants um but you know like it's so hard because there's so much dependence on it now too so it's like how can we envision a future where that's not the case like how can we envision a better future where you know these companies genuinely want the good of mankind and not necessarily just their own profits like i don't know i don't know but these are just okay that was such a random little tangent I'm, i mean thinking about like Parasite and its commentary on capitalism being like poor stay poor because they literally there's only so much social mobility around like they literally can't progress to that level and I think like the hard thing with Parasite is it really does only show those two sides like the working class is kind of a miracle of the modern age like it's crazy because back in you know and I, and I do think it's kind of becoming less common <laughs> like it kind of sucks but like when the Industrial Revolution happened and everybody was, like, this new class was kind of growing and the, you know, this class of the working class. And I, I know there were other equivalents, you know, the bourgeois or whatever, like, that, like, middle class that's not quite the highest level and not quite the lowest level. That middle class is the largest um, now, not necessarily right now, but, like, in, you know, um, human history. It's pretty large now compared to the, the history. That middle class is really where people... <laughs> Not necessarily, I guess, it's weird to say it this way, but I feel like people thrive best in the middle class. And this is something that, like, 
you know, the Bible talks about in like Ecclesiastes and other places where it's like, I hope I'm not too rich or too poor because both of those classes have an insane life. Like if you're too rich, there's so many things that are expected of you and so many things asked of you. And then when you're too poor, you're so many things that are taken from you. And so both of those places put you either as more than human when you're wealthy, you're more than human, you have superhuman abilities almost. And at least that's how it's painted. I'm sure, I know, I'm. it's not like you're not a human anymore, but I just mean like you almost have this idea that you're more than human. And then when you're too poor and you don't have any resources to meet your needs or ne- nearly enough resources, you're almost less than human. Like you're almost treated like objects. If you're poor enough, you're treated like objects. And so there's less social stigmas around causing harm to people, where if you're wealthier, you're seen as so valuable that if somebody were to attack you, which is also more likely, you would have to have bodyguards. And those bodyguards are an expected role that a lower class person is going to play, like middle working class probably more than poor poor. But like both of those places are targets to people because people either want to see them as a way to show superiority by killing off the lower class, like that's where a lot of like, and it's horrible and I'm just talking about it like, I don't have so many emotions behind it, but there's so much of that that makes me so angry where poor people are, you know, often the subjects of serial killings and those kind of things. And I've talked about Jack the Ripper. Like those are the kind of people that get attacked by these people that are like depraved and just, you know, but it's not the wealthy people because those people, if they do get killed, are seen that would be so much media coverage, right? That would be so, so much media coverage. And there's this concept um, that exists of, like, some people being more dead than other people, meaning that the society in general grieves more the loss of somebody that's seen as affluent or successful or capable of producing so much more for humanity versus people who are lower class and not able to produce as much. Like, these are all just, like, (laughs) random stuff that, like, I mean, I could be wrong, but, like, I feel like the stuff I'm observing and the way that I'm doing my research it feels pretty true to me that, like, there's so much difficulty that comes with being both too rich and too poor, but we struggle to have contentment in the middle. We struggle to have our needs met and just that. Because, like, there was this um, other video I watched, that, like, other stuff I've read that says that we have this second need beyond just our needs being met. We have this, like, unnecessary need of feeling better than other people of a superiority over other people and I hate that so much I hate that that is something that we feel like we need but it makes sense if we look at humanity like we're always trying to take more than our part and it's just like frustrating because parasite is really you know exploration of greed too because that family was trying to they started getting things and so then they got kind of greedy and they started trying to take more where I think if they had been more patient you know it's horrible but they would have been more successful like it's terrible and like obviously for the sake of the story it's good that (laughs) they were greedy but because that allowed the story to finish the way it did but that's it's so hard right like we want to be seen as valuable we want to be treated like you know we're so good and so meaningful but I think that there's this, like, you know, this core belief that we all share that we're not enough. We're not good enough no matter what we do. And so we seek these external validations to try to describe, like, show off to the world, like, hey, look at, look at, look, I'm good enough. Like, I went to college, I'm good enough. Like, look, I have this, you know, 4.0, I'm good enough. Like, that, those are all, you know, things that I would pursue anyway. But, like, the fact that I strive so hard to get that 4.0 wasn't necessarily for having a good grade or getting a scholarship because those were a little bit lower standards. Like, I wanted that because I wanted to feel superior to other people, which is disgusting, and I hate that about myself. But honestly, like, that's a real consistent human thing that happens. Like, we don't feel like we're enough on our own, and so we strive to prove that by being better than other people. (sighs) It's, It's really hard to quiet that and be content and uh, this is like I'm taking cultural commentary and then I'm talking about the bible too so but like I was studying in first timothy this morning and also like some other places in matthew I've been reading a lot in but they also say like there's this one verse it's like godliness with contentment is good but like 
people, you know, seeking off, seeking of wealth and like trying to get wealth, you're going to destroy yourself. Like that's just how it works. The you're going to be better off if you're just happy and you have your needs met. And often you'll probably have more than your needs because that's kind of, I mean, depending on depending on your circumstances, depending a lot on your circumstances. But like, if you need less, you're going to have your needs met faster. That's a really weird way to talk about it. But you know, there's that whole thing with lifestyle inflation where people start having more money. So they're like, oh, let me spend it this way. That's something that happens a lot with people where like having more money really doesn't change anything because their lives escalate to meet that. But I think if we can be intentional about asking for less and needing less, then we're able to be content with what we have, not only in the material sense, but in in something a little deeper. And not only that, but we're able to be generous with other people, which then gives us a level of satisfaction of like, wow, it's not about me anymore. It's not about us reaching or winning the game or whatever. Like, you have to leave the game. You have to get out of it. Like, the game is dumb and nobody wins. We all end in the same way and we all started the same way. So there's nothing really different about me than other people. And my life can take as big a turn as it needs to. Like, I can end up homeless, you know, in a few months even. Like, and and that would be really hard to get out of. So there's so many reasons why... We need to have more um, empathy and understanding for people that are in bad situations and going through things mentally that, you know, come alongside having bad situations. (laughs) Like, there's a really high correlation between mental illness and homelessness. And I think that that's something serious that we need to be better about addressing socially. Because I think mental illnesses are starting to become... I mean, they've always been something you can deal with if you're wealthier. But it's starting to be like this weird, I'm not sure how to word it. I don't even know if I'm right about that. Like it's almost being taken as like, oh, look at this little like quirky feature about me. If you're wealthy, it's like a quirky feature. If you're not, it's this disgusting depravity of showing that you deserve it. Like we're always trying to justify why people are in bad situations to ourselves because we can't just address that like, wow, I could deserve that too. And I probably do. Like, I probably also have left my car unlocked at some point. Does that mean that I deserve to have my car broken into? No, but someone else who also left their car unlocked and it did get broken into didn't deserve it more, you know? Anyway, all that to say, these are some random thoughts that I'm having as I'm about to go to Aldi. And uh, I really want to make some art about it and talk about, you know, some of this stuff, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know. (laughs) I might make a comic or something. I'm still writing a lot and I'm still probably going to be writing something about this. But for now, I'm just going to be observing, just observing reality, observing life and living it. So I'm going to go grocery shopping and actually make some food. So catch you guys later. I think I want to somehow use my capstone to address uh, economic disparity, but I don't know how to do that in a few months. I can't solve world, you know, economic disparity. Like, that is such a huge complex issue tied to so many different things. And oversimplification and trying to cram it down into five months might do more harm than good. But keeping it in mind with whatever solution I do integrate, will probably be a good idea especially when it comes to like the systemic issues that require some systemic solution but you know that's a lot of change and so we have to do one small step towards something even better so anyway um i've been very like i've been thinking about this a lot like today it's just been like racing my mind like boom 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 thinking through like everything that i've You know, in the past year or two, I would say I've almost been, like, playing wealthy. Like, pretending like I had enough money for things. But the truth of the matter is I don't. The truth of the matter is I'm still skimming the bottom of the barrel when it comes to, like, my social status. I'm a student, but, like, it's important to keep in mind that my family currently is not well off. Like, at all. And that's contributed to some of the stress, and I know there's so many other factors involved I'm not going to oversimplify it and say that it's because of money, 
but there's a lot of class differences going on and a lot of desire to move up socially without having the social mobility to do so and staying in jobs that are suck for the sake of survival um but you could see like across multiple layers of like my family right now um there's so much like I've had to work through a lot of my own pride and wanting to feel like superior to other members of you know or not even necessarily other members but just like overcoming that social status of being so poor and then like being able to go to college I don't know how I did that and like yes my grades are good but that's also because I'm in an environment where that success is more likely and that's even an option for me you know it's just really hard to try to work towards a better system, not necessarily system, but just better environment, like, situation in general, and not get caught up in trying to get one particular outcome, or one, um, you know, reaching a status that's going to be good enough. Um, it's important, I guess, to keep in mind, and I think this has been especially apparent this last time going home, um, the level of, not sure what word to use, disparity? I'm still in financially, and I know my family is okay, like, they're surviving, we're not homeless yet, but it's still just, like, shocking. I think once I have that cushion removed and I'm forced to face, like, yeah, this is, you know, I'm looking at a lot of hard, hard years to come for me, so, I don't know, this is me just, like, rambling to a camera right now, but, um... Yeah, I'm anticipating a lot of hard work and hardship, um, but, you know, part of me making these vlogs is anticipating hope for the future as well, so I'm still hoping in a better future, but that better future has to be a, not just me, you know, like, I can't just be successful, it has to be, you know, everybody, but I also can't bury that whole weight on my shoulders, I didn't make this problem, it's not mine to fix, but it is mine to try to be observant and to be aware of the ways it's affecting me. Um, I'm gonna go watch a movie because I'm privileged enough to do that and enjoy some soup and be sick for a little bit. I'm still pretty off, like it's pretty sick and it's gonna take more than a day to get over that, so. <sighs> but I went to Aldi this time instead of going to a ridiculously bougie store so that I wasn't just buying that feeling of feeling rich. But I'm buying what I can actually afford, but anyway. All that aside, I'm going to go watch the movie now. Um, I'll catch you guys later. Hello, I'm back again. Um, we're just chilling in my living room. I just finished the movie Dark Shadows. And I have a few thoughts. So, what better place to share those random thoughts, oh my gosh, than the internet, where people can just watch them. <sighs> I don't know what's going on, man. Um, so, I took a few notes down in my little notebook. Um... So, first thoughts, um, Tim Burton movie, so it's gonna feel like a Tim Burton movie, about vampires, so that's kind of what it's about. So I had some thoughts. So, that, one thing, first off, I didn't really like it. It's not really my kind of movie, not really my jam. I think they could have done some things better, and if I was gonna write it, not how I would have done it, but, you know, that's kind of Tim Burton or whatever. Um, so it's strange in that it, like, kind of paints all characters. Uh, I don't mean, like, all, all characters. I just mean, like, all the female characters just wanted to have sex with the main character. In fact, I think pretty much all of them did. Except for the ones in his family. That would have been really weird. But, like, I just... The character didn't say no. Like, he wasn't playing a main character in that point. Like, he was just like, oh, I guess this is happening now? And I'm just like, oh, you don't even want this. <laughs> like, what are you doing right now? Um, so yeah, I thought the main character was kind of, a, kind of a weak character in that area. We were in some other areas too. Very morally gray main character, honestly. And if you think about it for more than like five minutes, you're kind of like, okay. I mean, spoilers ahead. Okay, this kid actually kind of is the cause of all of this. And they just kind of brush past that. Like, it's the woman's fault. It's always been the witch. Even the end, the, um, his great-great-granddaughter or whatever, the mother of the family that lives there now, was, like, 
in they were in this battle between the the witch angie and the main character guy bartholomew and they're fighting and she has this moment like the main the um mom is standing there like oh it's always been the mom it's always been the witch like it's always been her and while technically curse wise that's very true let's not completely discard the fact that this woman has experienced deep deep pain and that's kind of caused by the main character and we just zoom past that in fact that same character the mother character also completely reinforces the main guy bartholomew as being innocent earlier in the story when he's kind of lamenting his past mistakes she just pats him on the shoulder like turns off the piano where he's like planking on his head like playing the music with his head <laughs> it's such a weird thing to have happen but um she walks up she turns it off to show like hey let's get out of the overly dramatic let's not be emotional here and then also is like hey you also fought really hard for your family who cares that you killed half the townspeople like you fought really hard for them you were fighting for your family and families first and foremost for family is all that matters and that's basically what the overall theme was like family is the only thing like the blood is thicker than water line was used at the end i think that's interesting that that is actually only part of the quote I don't remember exactly what the whole quote is, but it's like, blood is thicker than water, but, um, man, somebody's gonna have to, I'll have to look into that later. I don't remember what it is. Um, so, he doesn't have really a whole lot of remorse, like, as far as how he treated her, but he does, like, when the characters do, like, the, um, Angie or whatever, they have sex, um, he does show a lot of remorse and is like, wow, I'm so sorry I did that. And I can't ever let that happen again. Meanwhile, they have an extremely underdeveloped love interest. I would have loved to see more of the story from her perspective. Because it starts off from her perspective. And I felt like that was a really strong start. She starts off by lying about her name. And you get the sense that she's different from other people. Or that she's escaping the law or something. She walks kind of carefully past... Um, police officers. So it starts off really strong from her perspective. And then it dumps like completely drops her as the protagonist after like that first introduction i feel like that was a really really weak move and they only really just revisit her when it helps to show something about the main love and the main guy character so she's only there to be the person that he's fighting for she only really stands for herself when she jumps off the cliff to her own death when she has pretty much nothing else to like literally the love interest is the only thing she's got going on like the the visions of his past love and the love interest is all she's got going for her. Her family has disowned her. She doesn't have any career aspects. She doesn't have any hobbies or any other things. She just literally woke up from the psych ward and was like, hmm, I want to go find something to live for. And she found him as the thing to live for. And we feel like that's a victory. I don't think that's a victory. I really don't. <laughs> I feel like that's not a victory at all. But, you know, it's all right. We make it work. Um... So that's some of my thoughts on that. And I also um, noticed, because I wasn't taking notes the whole time, I only really started taking notes at the end. So the things that I'm noticing, like, okay, there's overall stuff, but I didn't go through and, like, break it down scene by scene or anything. Um, there's this idea of, like, the abject woman that you knows the archetype that we're talking about more recently as somebody that is counter that typical expectations for a woman and uh, and kind of in a repulsive way like you feel repulsed by that and you're like no I really don't want any part of that um we see that especially with like the main teen character she's like a young adult um we hear about her you know being sexually experimental and other aspects of her life where she's trying things out that um gross her family out horrify her family out um and it's like the 70s so it's that time where you know things were changing very quickly um socially and i think it's really interesting that they end up making her into a monster as well like no one else in the family besides the main vampire character which has some inherent themes but no other characters in the family become a monster besides this teen girl and i think that a vampire or not a vampire a werewolf being the one that she becomes is really interesting like she's basically become this like 
not quite human animal thing that has animal instincts and you know in a lot of ways being a teenage girl is unpredictable and your hormones are crazy and you're just like what am I doing and so the character being portrayed always as this like the two kids are always being treated like they're not monsters exactly but like definitely other like definitely not the same as their parents um and so like you see her dancing to some music and her family's just like turn that off like get get it under control go to your room um rather than engaging in a more nuanced way they just kind of are sending her off um so interestingly being cursed with being a a werewolf allows her to contribute in some way in the fighting scene but it's that also contributing to that main character's like his plight to win um he she also uh contributes earlier on in the plot for telling him how to succeed romantically with the love interest um so i don't know it's just like a lot of random stuff and like i like i liked her character acting almost like as us just like a shock of like what are you talking about to that guy um that we kind of wish we could say to like oh my gosh what are you saying right now birthing hips like what's going on so you see that abject teenager um manifesting physically in the werewolf form but we also another interesting thing is she is actually made that way by the um mad woman witch archetype so like that's a really i thought that was an interesting thought um i don't know the the witch is a really interesting character to try and break down a little bit because in the story she's the villain right in the story she's the heartless villain who just says she loves him but wants to possess him if we go back to that original storyline where he is the prince in this family essentially prince like they're a wealthy family which in you know modern capitalism terms is you know basically a prince and she's coming up to him as a servant and is trying to get his attention his affection and she loves him in the best way that she knows how clearly there's some funky stuff going on i mean she's got to deal with the devil so there's some funky stuff going on with that but she's loving him the best way she knows how but he sees her as less than him like she he sees her as an unvaluable prospect and so for her to be completely invaluable i think she takes that more personally than not necessarily than she should but it is about her status and her place in life not her as a person that he's rejecting and that's a really hard thing for her to come to terms with and I don't think she ever really does and I don't think he ever addresses that like he doesn't say the reason that he couldn't be with her is because of like the fact that she was a servant it was just kind of wow like he just used her but like of course he did he didn't have a choice he couldn't resist himself and because she's so beautiful and but like in real history like that's not usually the way that it works out like she's not necessarily some kind of enchantress who's got villainous goals for him she was probably genuinely in love with him and he used that to get what he wanted from her so he also just wanted to use her so i don't know that's uh, weird weird to talk about and obviously the idea that she's just some kind of crazy woman who never could love to begin with the visuals of her being this doll that's hollow and fragmented and fracturing externally to show the hollowness of her own person and her being as well as that one character the mom again who is always just acting as like his emotions like the main characters can't process himself like what his emotions are and so she steps in and tells him hey this is what's going on this is what you should feel about this it's kind of weird but you know it's that is what it is um but she tells him that he she doesn't hate him it's not hatred that's driving this like extreme passion of wanting to destroy him and his family it's hurt love and i think that it's legitimate like she's acting from pain but i think a lot of it is like when we try to put all of our stake into one aspect and when we try and put everything into a relationship or into something you get all your worth from that 
when that thing is taken, it impacts you in a way that is completely irreconcil irrevocable, irreconcilable. I don't know. She couldn't come to terms with the fact that he couldn't love her, but that was also like she was completely, completely wrapped up in that situation in him loving her. Like if she had other stuff like to hope in, and I mentioned this earlier. Like if you, I don't like that the main love interest in this movie also doesn't have anything else going on. Like he's become this only source of life for her. And so it's either he loves her or she destroys him. That is how the, that love interest is. But I think it's crazy because there's not really any difference quantitatively between the girl that he had sex with and didn't end up marrying and the girl that he, you know, fell in love with and wanted to marry. Except for the fact that he doesn't have sex with those characters. Like, I know I'm saying that a lot, but, like, I just think it's really weird that, like, if he had loved and genuinely loved that servant girl, she would have become that love interest. Like, there wouldn't have been a difference. But, like, something about the other person being more pure and innocent and valuable, like, that that's some crazy stuff and, like, just really not... I don't know. It doesn't... It doesn't feel right to me. Like, I don't think that there's a distinction between the two. I don't think that there's some people that are like, oh, this person was the right love interest. This person is the villain. Like, I don't know. If he had chosen the other girl, that would have been just the same. Like, there's no difference between the two. Um, and, like, it's weird that, like, the villain character has a much better love story with the main character than the love interest. Like, that is really, really like shallow to me the the way that the love interest loved him was so shallow and so, so like they have one conversation he introduced himself and she heard from the teenage girl that he had a crush on her like there is nothing there there is no development of a relationship and then she's willing to die for him and become undead for him like this girl really didn't have anything else besides the psych ward like she just left the psych ward. She doesn't know what else there is in the world. She should have hung out with those hippies longer. Like, she would have made actual friends. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, it's just, like, I hate the way that they made that girl crazy instead of saying, like, hey, it was 100% his fault that this turned out this way. Okay, I won't say 100%, but for real, like, think about it. If she had been the, lo the person he actually loved... It wouldn't be, like, nearly as, like, I don't know. There would have been a different plot point. But, like, that would have been so much more interesting. I don't know. It's just frustrating when characters are so one-dimensional. Like, she also didn't actually care about anything else besides his love. I don't know. It would have been more interesting if she had other points of interest. Other things going on. Um... So, yeah, and then I think family as the ultimate source of power, we see that in, like, the end of the movie, especially with the way that they fought together and that haunted the ghost that came back and killed that, um, I can't think of the word, enchantress woman, um, that was very powerful, actually. Like, that was a really interesting, interesting thought, and I'm not sure how I feel about that yet, but it, it is the theme that they're trying to build to. Um, and then along with that, failed familial love is seen as, like, the ultimate mis- I wrote this really blurry looking line, alright, misunderstanding or, like, ultimate failure. The ultimate sin was failing as a parent or being cruel to a child. That, um, main character's parents didn't understand her and basically just sent her off to a psych ward without, like, any attempt to understand her. And so that is seen- as like the ultimate sin by that main the main character who sees family as the number one um i also thought it was really kind of a weak plot that he was the only powerful male character in this entire world like there were no other powerful men characters and so all the women were just into him and it just seems kind of like 
there were no other men for them to be interested in. The only other guy was like a liar and a thief and he was like a really weak character. He was a really, really weak character. The dad, very weak. And then the servants obviously are fairly weak as well. The only other guy character besides that brother, the um, father character was that servant guy and he was just a, you know, hypnotized man. Like, I think it's kind of ridiculous too that all the, like, I'm pretty sure all the other men in the movie get hypnotized by that main character or killed by him. That's a little bit like, man, nobody else is like, there's no no one else that can get that female attention either. I don't know. It just feels a little bit weak to me that that happened. Um, so then the line, like, at the end, as the woman is dying, like, you, he, she says, I loved you. And he says, like, I, there could have been a point where we ended up together. There could have been a time when I did love you. And she's like, you know, what's, why not? Like, we can, still can. You can still make up for it. Which is so sad. Like, she genuinely cared about him. She gave him her heart. And it's because he rejected it that she became completely hollow. Like, I don't know if he sees that correlation. He's like, you can't love. While she's giving him a literal beating heart. Like, he's like, you have no heart. It is literally right in front of you, man. Like, and then it becomes hollow and you reject it. Like, I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so she says, take it. And then it falls apart. So, like, he should have loved that servant girl. But instead, he destroyed her. And, you know, the servants in the family aren't seen as equals. There's not only, a, you know, emotional distance, there's also a physical distance. The romantic interest is definitely oversimplified. And not only in, like, personality, but her experience of life. She's like a child compared to him. She's literally never been out in the real world since she was, like, a little, little kid. Especially not as an adult. And I think it's really... I don't know. It's just frustrating because it seems like she's only in love with him really because of her naivety. Like, she really just doesn't have any life experiences. And I, you know, that whole classic age difference where the man's, like, way more experienced. And it's just, like, kind of boring. Like, we've heard this before. Like, we've heard this so many times before. Um, yeah. And then I think... What did I write? I thought it was cool the way that they sandwiched it. So they started with her falling and then him becoming a vampire in the beginning. Like that love interest falling and becoming, him becoming a vampire. Second time, he gets to make up for his mistakes the first time. He catches her before she falls. But she still jumps to her death willingly this time. So that she can become either dead or one with him in vampirehood. And... It felt so flat to me that in the end they said, blood is thicker than water and my curse was broken. Like, no, your curse freaking wasn't. You're still a vampire. There's two of you now. The curse of being alone, maybe? I don't know. I feel like when the witch died, the curse should have been broken. Like, he should have just become a person. And, but I don't know. I don't, I'm not trying to, like, fix it. It just didn't end well to me. Like, it just didn't... There wasn't any depth. Like, it didn't say what it could have said. And I also just think, like, there were so many just things that, like, were strung out there but never revisited. And, yeah, they revisited the fact that the doctor died because they saw her in the end as, like, oh, she's alive again. She's a vampire now. But it's, like, did we really, like... I don't know. It just doesn't feel like there was any kind of thought put into that part of the storyline that she was just there to be into him and to be into becoming a vampire I don't know I didn't like it but that's just me um yeah those are that's pretty much my thoughts 20 minutes of me rambling to a camera um I don't know I could be wrong tell me if I'm wrong these are mostly just observations I don't necessarily think there's one thing that would have fixed it but I think there's a lot of things that felt a bit lazy it felt a bit um outdated as far as like do we really need to bring up these archetypes again do we really need a woman that like doesn't have a heart that like the main character is completely blind to the fact that he destroyed her life I don't feel like we need that again I'm kind of done with it um 
I don't know. I would definitely have done a few other things differently. But, yeah, tell me, tell me your thoughts if you guys have any. This might have to be, you know, a whole, not necessarily series I do, but I'm paying attention to these things, these little things, and I know that I'm definitely not, I, I don't know anything about film interpretation. It's just, like, those things that I catch on to with the consistent storytelling stuff. And it's interesting to pay attention to those themes that might be might be uh, solidifying some uh, unhealthy thoughts and unhealthy ideas because that's definitely like if somebody believed that that kind of stuff in the story was in some ways applicable to real life or that there were women out there like that main character that are the result of you know them being crazy and not the pain that they've experienced that's concerning to me um but yeah, that's going to be it for me for now and probably the rest of the night. But um, yeah, back in my apartment, chilling. Um, had some soup for dinner, really good stuff. Uh, went to the grocery store, bought some food. Um, felt very aware, not only of my privilege, but of the limitations of, you know, money and other things. So just that the thoughts that I've been having a lot lately with, you know, the insane blessings that I have, but also the awareness that, um, classes, class differences are definitely a struggle, and I don't know, I already rambled about that enough today, so I'm gonna call it it for now, I'm a little sleepy because I just made some sleepy time tea, but, uh, I'll catch you guys tomorrow, so, bye!